welcome to welcome back to my channel we're here today to talk about february reads the books that we finished in february as well as the books that we started and are still reading so in february i finished seven books i tried to focus my reading on black history mm. month <laughs> so quite a few of the books that i read were by african-american authors but i also had some other books that i read for other reasons and we'll just talk a little bit about them here. The first book that I finished in February was No One Is Coming to Save Us by Stephanie Powell Watts. That is a novel that was touted as being kind of a retelling of The Great Gatsby. But I disagreed with that comparison. I thought that the novel was a strong enough allegory, sim sim symbolism on its own. The plot of the stories that we're following two generations of a family, a mother and her daughter. And we're seeing the generational curses of infidelity and how women deal with their spouses being unfaithful to them. We're seeing that pervade through the generations. And the reason that these women kind of don't address what is happening in their spousal relationships is because they become focused on motherhood whether in becoming a mother or the role of being a mother so the adult well the mother has lost her son and she feels a loss and mourns the loss of him like a physical hole in her life and so she's kind of checked out of her relationship and we also see that she's taught her daughter to do the same thing because her adult daughter has been trying to become a mother and several miscarriages later she's almost desperate for a pregnancy to stick and so she kind of excuses her husband's unfaithfulness she turns a blind eye to the she turns a blind eye to everything that's happening in her marriage and when she sees the results of her husband's unfaithfulness it's as though she focuses on the fact that he has a child with someone mm. else as opposed to the fact that he's been unfaithful to her so that becomes a big part of the story but there's also a mirror reflecting the characters on their town on their environment and we see parallels between how unfruitful these relationships are with how difficult it is for them to survive and to thrive in their environment it's one of those towns where the major industry has changed and so people don't have jobs their livelihoods are threatened but they're also barren in a lot of other ways and so i thought the author did a really good job of showing these parallels between people and their environment between um all these major characters reflecting some of the same themes but showing how individuals individual circumstances might display those themes in a different way so i thought that the book was really well written in no I thought that the book was really, I thought the story, I thought the plot was really well executed, but the writing could have been a little bit stronger. I did a buddy read of this one with Kay, who's one of my subscribers, and we had, we had pretty different thoughts on the book while we were reading it, but ultimately, I think we both thought that the author did a good job of showing the parallels between <laughs> what are you doing ultimately I think we both enjoyed the book maybe I enjoyed it a little bit more than she did but I think we came to the agreement that the that the plot was well conceived even if the writing could have been a little bit better executed Stephanie Paul Watts is a really good storyteller I read a short story collection from her last year um, this one was no one is coming to save us that was we are taking only what we need or something like that and I'd like to read more from her so that's the first book that I finished in February and I gave that four stars 
and I read that one as an ebook download from my library. The second book I finished was The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. I have a paperback copy, so I read this one in physical format. That is a meditation on beauty and appearance thinly disguised as a novel. It is Toni Morrison's debut work. So I started reading that in January and finished it in February. This was a reread for me, and I think it's the reason that it took me so long to read it because I knew how the book was going to go, but I was just focused on everything that Morrison was saying as a theme, as a representation of beauty, as a letter from a black girl to society, the society that does not recognize her or would chasing her for things that are beyond her control. This was a really sad book. The plot of this one, well, it's also a multi-perspective look at, you want to see it too? It's a multi-perspective look at a young girl's life and experience. This young girl named Piccola who has been abused by her father, abused by her parents in different ways, abused by society in so many different ways. So, She's been raped by her father and impregnated by him. Her mother doesn't love her because, well, when we read the parents' stories, we also know that neither one of Piccola's parents understand how to love because they themselves were not loved. They grew up in societies that didn't reward them for being born. And so when you take people who've been abused people who don't have the capacity to love we can't expect that they will give something that they've never had themselves and so Piccola grows up in this family and even when her father <laughs> destroys their family home and she goes to live in a family and we meet the two girls who would be her foster sisters even in that relationship we see how she is <laughs> ostracized she seems to be very dark-skinned she's described as being ugly and from the title we know that she associates beauty with blonde hair blue eyes and so she thinks that if she could just change the color of her eyes then she would also have the experience of beauty and with it the good life the acceptance that society would give a beautiful girl that Piccola has never experienced. Toni Morrison's writing, even from this, her debut novel, is haunting in its ability to capture and reflect realness and not necessarily the really good things, but the really negative things that we want to change. Toni Morrison's writing is like the voice for the voiceless, where she explores and explains things that maybe you never really thought about that way, but when she highlights it as a <laughs> when she highlights it as an issue in our society you want to do something to change it so you know it made me want to go out and find a little girl and just hug her and love on her so that's what I'm doing with this little one so that's the second book that I read the third book that I finished was a book that I'm reading for the booktube prize judging so I can't talk about it. I'll just tell you the title. It is A Woman is No Man by Ita Fromm. And it is about a Palestinian American. Uh, Palestinian? Yeah, Palestinian Americans living in the United States. Dual perspective novel where we're reading about um, women who are existing in arranged marriages and how they teach their daughters about marriage, about expectation of love or not. So I'll be talking more about that one when I do my recap about my experience judging the book two prize, but for now, can't talk too much about it. Then the next book that I read was the Read Soul Lit Pick this year was The Last Thing You Surrender by Leonard Pitts Jr. And Dee Dee did a fantastic job in choosing that book because it's not one that was on my radar before, but I really 
thoroughly enjoy the experience of reading that book and being able to discuss it with such a wide group of people. It centered on characters during World War II and we had several main characters. <laughs> One is a Caucasian man living in the South and he goes to fight in the Navy. And while he is aboard the ship docked in Pearl Harbor, they're attacked and a black man, a black Navy officer who's been working in a menial job, I mean, do we even consider him to be an, an officer? He's been working as a busboy and he saves his life but loses his in the process and so we follow this main character, George, as he tries to go back home, dealing with his sense of guilt, but also trying to reconcile it by wanting to take care of this man's widow and family that he left behind. And as we meet the widow and her family, we're introduced to other main characters and we see the horrors that they have experienced in their own lives. And so this author, Leonard Pitts Jr., he talked a lot about, you know, the racial injustice that the black characters suffered. But he also showed how happiness was not assured just because you were white, because there were degrees of acceptance even within the white community. There were people who just weren't considered white enough, people who were Europeans but had come later. And so he talked a lot about acceptance and about the degrees of racism that we don't often hear discussed. And I thought it was a fantastic take on a story. My issues with the book were that it was graphic in its description of the violence that these characters experienced. And while you associate the violence with books that are historical fiction or war-based, some of the writing was just was just hard to read. But I mean, I can't think of a book that has described war events that has been pleasant. So I can't make this, I can't say that this was any worse. But it's not one that I'd probably rush to reread just for that reason. There were some images, some gruesome descriptions that will probably stick with me a lot longer than anything else so yeah i enjoyed the book i enjoyed discussing it with other people but not one that i would want to reread although i do want to read read i do want to read more from this author so both of those books were ebooks that i read from the library a woman is no man i read as a kindle download and the last thing we surrender the last thing you surrender i listened to an audio version that was my only audiobook for the month and then I read another ebook, Kindred by Octavia Butler. This was my first time reading Octavia Butler, and I thoroughly enjoyed this one. The plot of this story is that we're meeting a African American woman in the 1970s. I think it's 1976. She has she has a, a white husband, black woman, white husband, and on the day when they're moving into their new house she experiences uh, an episode where she time travels back to the 1800s when slavery is still going on and she travels there by herself and she's there for some time and meets a white boy who is going to become one of her ancestors and so she's charged with saving his life and multiple times she goes back and forth between times traveling back to the 1800s every time this boy and as he transitions into a man every time he is in danger of losing his life he somehow is able to reach out to her and she travels back in time to save him because she has to save him so that she could be born so she has to make sure that he stays alive long enough to have her and as a very fascinating plot and Octavia Butler really explored a lot of things in that book 
you know, the fact that this black woman is married to a white man in a period after, well, you know, she doesn't have to worry about an interracial relationship because the period of, well, the civil war has been fought and civil rights war has been fought. And so she's enjoying the freedom that should be commonplace. But when she moves back in time, when she travels back in time and there is a section where her husband time travels with her and it tests their relationship because they are there in a place and time where their marriage would be illegal. And so, you know, how does it change their relationship when they're able to escape? If they're able to escape, how will they take back or take along the relics of an experience of slavery and how will that change the relationship that should exist in the 1900s. Fascinating story. I thought that Octavia Butler did a fantastic job of conceiving a plot and executing it. It was a very interesting story. It was supremely well written. I want to read more from her. I think this is going to be another one of my completest exercises where I try to read all of her novels. I can't believe it's taken me so long to experience her. And again, I read that as an ebook from the library. Life After Life by Kate Atkinson. I started reading this. This was my first book that I started reading in January. Finally finished it. I read this as a combination print copy from my shelves, audiobook from the library, and ebook from the library. So I read all of those three formats and finally finished it. Loved it. The premise of this story is also around World War II. But we meet a young girl named Ursula and she keeps being born over and over again. No, what happened? Okay, time for a little break. What happened, Duncan? What happened? What happened? What happened? Mm? You hear about the lady being born? Okay, smiles. So the concept of life after life, okay, we need to finish. We need to finish. We're running out of time. The concept of this one is that we have this young girl who almost dies when she's born and there are several variations of her life story one, <laughs> you see yourself one is that she is stillborn one is that she is born and dies almost immediately and several iterations where she dies at different points in her life but Almost every time she retains not quite a memory of what happens she retains kind of a sense like a deja vu kind of experience and she's able to make choices that would impact not just her life but the lives of other people around her and ultimately World War two right <laughs> I thought that Kate Atkinson did a fantastic job of conceiving and executing that story. All the different parallel lives that we read about, all the different ways that she took the story and tied up loose ends, tied up, <sighs> made connections between all the different iterations of Ursula's story. Loved it, loved it, loved it. So that was, that was book number six. And the seventh book that I finished in February was The Yellow House by Sarah M. Broom. This is a nonfiction, my only nonfiction of the month. And that is the 2019 National Book Award winner for nonfiction memoir. Sarah Broom's family, well, Sarah Broom herself grew up in New Orleans and her family experienced some displacement during Hurricane Katrina. And because at the time she was not present, the loss of her house, the loss of her family home, and the, the displacement of her family members as a result of them losing their home and you know moving across the country and it taking, I think she said like 12 years for them to get a settlement on the house. Just the different experiences that this family and you know them being a representation of other people from their community and their experience as a result of that tragedy. It was very impactful to read about this woman and her family's experience and to know that this is not a unique story, that indeed there are people right here in this country who are experiencing this kind of hardship. I thought, <laughs> I thought she did a fantastic job of 
writing her family story she explains how she explains the process of taking notes from conversations that she was having with her mother and with her siblings and just her process of recording and communicating the life that she wanted to share with us i thought it was just so beautifully done i i loved her prose she starts off her paragraphs no she starts off her chapters with these really illuminating and attention grabbing sentences and paragraphs that just make you want to read more from her so sarah m broom she is <laughs> and this book i body read with heidi from my reading life and patrice who is an awesome subscriber and are you kissing me <laughs> thank you for the kisses this is the first time you've ever done that and now we have it on camera <laughs> mommy loves you mm. mommy loves you that's not my first time kissing you though mm. yes so that was those are the seven books that we finished in february i also have another book that I mean, technically, I didn't read the whole thing, but I wanted to show it to you here because I went through this book in February as well. This is The Blue Zones Kitchen by Dan Butner. This is a cookbook. Photographs are beautiful. Photographs by David McLean. And this is 100 Recipes to Live to 100. In this one, Dan Butner shares the lessons that he learned about longevity from visiting these blue zones across the world, the places in the country and across the world where people live to be a hundred with high um high occurrences and he took what he learned from them and compiled recipes in this book and so i didn't read the whole thing because i didn't read all the recipes but i read his notes um what he said about these countries and this is a fantastic book I've read about mm, I've read about the blue zones previously and so I got this as a review copy from the publishers. I'm sorry, this came from National Geographic because Dan Butner he um he came up with the idea to study these blue zones and call them the blue zones from a project that he was doing with National Geographic way back in the early 2000s. And so it's only fitting. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, what's that? Yeah. Your your friend on your hand? Yeah. Okay. So we have to wrap this up. Um, Dan Butner. I did a full review of this one on my blog. I'll put a link to the description. I'll put a link in the description box down below to my blog review. So the blue zone in the United States is Loma Linda, California. And that is peopled by the Seventh-day Adventist church members who live the health message which the Seventh-day Adventist Church espouses a plant-based diet. And if you're not familiar, maybe if you haven't been watching this channel for a while, you might not know that I'm also a Seventh-day Adventist, but I have not been eating that vegetarian diet. So when I read books like that, it makes me want to go back to those habits. So. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in future videos. So for now, these are the books that I finished in February. Seven books that I read all the way through and a cookbook that I read mostly. No, some. <laughs> so those are my February reads. I'd love to chat with you in the comments down below. I'd love to hear what books you read in February and what made the greatest impression on you. And give us a thumbs up if you like this video. Subscribe if you want to see more. And we'll be back soon for another video. So for now, let's chat in the comments. And until next time, happy reading. Bye. Are you going to wave? Oh, you're going to wave? Take your hand out of your mouth and wave. Wave. Wave or give them a smile. Give them a smile. Smile. You're on candid camera.